worship conference first. We've done Q&A panels and discussions, but it's always been with other worship leaders. And so I think this is just a great opportunity for us to hear from a group of pastors and to get your guys' perspective and input and to hear your heart about worship. So uh, maybe we could just start by, you guys could introduce yourselves, where you're from, and uh, whatever you want to say about yourself. But maybe one thing you could let us know, I know a couple of you are musicians as well. You've had experience leading worship, and uh, so maybe you could indicate who you are. Those of you that are who musical. Who are you? <laughs> I'm uh, Zach Besnies. I'm the pastor of Calvary Chapel Petaluma and, uh, and have had experience in lead worship at the church as well as uh, the senior pastor. So. Oh, so you guys just met me. I'm Nate Holdridge, pastor of Calvary Monterey, and I've, I, I have led worship one time. I learned three songs on the guitar, and I led worship in the junior high ministry one time, and I've never been invited back ever since then. But yeah. you used to rap. But I do though. have a musical career. You used yeah, to rap. Yeah. yeah, thank you for bringing that up, Zach. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, got, I have some hip-hop game. Yes. Yeah, I do. Yeah, when I, was, uh, when I was a younger man, when I was a younger man, what's that? They want to hear a little sample. Oh, uh, no, I'm retired. I'm retired, but... Uh, if you're savvy, you could find me on Spotify or iTunes and, uh, you know, enjoy. I, I, could, I, had, I could spit some game, but no, no longer, no longer. Yeah. It was good. Hey, my name is Ed Taylor. I'm the pastor at Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado, just outside of Denver. We've been there for 18 years, and I have zero musical ability whatsoever. My name is Richard Cimino, and I'm from Metro Calvary, um, in Roseville, California, up by Sacramento, and um, I have marginal musical ability. He's I own awesome. some. I own some He's guitars. Awesome. <laughs> Richard rocks. Uh, my name's Pete Nelson. Um, I've been for the last few years planning a church in Sydney, Australia, One Love Church. Just recently moved back to Southern California, and we're planning One Love Church in Thousand Oaks. And uh, great to be with you guys. I can play guitar a little bit. That's modesty. Um, I'm Brian Broderson, pastor of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And I have a knack for hanging out with good musicians, but unfortunately nothing ever wore off on me. So uh, I just get to hang out with guys and sort of pretend like I'm in the band, but uh, <laughs> No, but I had a little bit of worship leading back when I was younger, and the the classic moment was when I I, I, I taught, and it was I knew it was good. You know, it was one of those times where you're just like, man, you're in such a groove. And this is in the early days when I was pa first pastoring a church, and because there was no worship leader, so my wife and I led worship. And that night I taught, and then I said, okay, we're going to close with a song. And I got up to do that, and I sat on the stool, and one of the legs was off the, the stage. And the next thing you know, I was behind the piano and, you know, clanging around, <laughs> trying to make my way out of there. So it was a very humbling moment, and that was sort of the end of my worship leading career. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, I thought maybe the, the starting point uh, for the discussion is, um, I think we talk a lot about at these conferences the relationship between the, the worship pastor or the worship leader and the, the, the pastor, senior pastor, lead pastor. And um, maybe you guys could describe how, how you view that relationship, the importance of it, how you view it, um, because I think... I think it's important to hear just maybe even some of the differences or the diversity, because I think there can be a lot of expectations around that relationship, and to hear from you guys would be helpful. Is this how this is going to go, where I'm first? <laughs> I knew there was a reason this chair was empty. Okay, so how, how important that relationship is. I, I, I think that it can be one of the most beautiful relationships in the church. I think it's really important. You know, the, the, in, as a worship leader, you know, you're leading worship, but really in a big sense, what you're doing is you're planning the services, the church services, 
and making sure that the flow of the whole day is working well and really God honoring. You're trying to think through a lot of different details. And, you know, I know for me, it's been such a blessing to just be able to think about teaching the word and then m moving into that ministry without having to really think a lot about the, all the, you know, s structure of the service. So I think it's really important, you know, to be able to, um, with, with our guys, I like to be able to have guys that I feel like we could just riff off of each other. We could lead prayer meetings together. We could go in and out of songs and in and out of prayer time together because even though we plan our services, I want to be able to come up on stage and just know that I could pray for five minutes and lead the church in some kind of prayer time, which is especially important with like a disaster happening every week in our nation. So it's good to be able to just kind of pray and without being kind of tight together, I think it'd be pretty tough to pull that off. So I think that relationship's really important, really vital, because you, ha you have to be able to have, you know, you want them to be able to say to you, hey, that was weird, and you want to be able to say to them, that was weird, and not feel, like, uh, too sensitive about that, you know, safe with each other. Yeah, I, I think that the relationship is, has got to be filled with love and trust, and because that, that, that face time before the congregation is just as important or even sometimes more important than the teaching segment of the of the service because some people are ministered to through the music long before they're already the holy spirit's already dealing with them long before the message you know and and i think that that worship isn't just like a a warm up for the bible study it it is the announcement of the presence of the lord and an invitation to to enter into his presence and and to leave I mean, you think about it. I was thinking about it sitting in the back today. How many stories are in this room right now? What things you guys left at home? What's on your mind? What phone call you, you're ignoring? What issues? What came in the mail? What the doctor said? And, and all of the things that we're leaving behind that the, the, the service itself is an integrated time to, to captivate someone while, they ha while you have their attention. And uh, I've been able to serve with the same uh, worship leader for over 10 years now. Uh, he, he knows me very well. I know him very well and been a, been a part of his life. He's been a part of my life. And, and just trust and love because um, I need to be able to trust him that he loves the Lord, that he loves the church, that he's hearing from the Holy Spirit. And, and then I'm always amazed how when we are able to, uh, to come together for a service and just intersect so beautifully uh, in, in serving. So those two things are the most important uh, piece. And, and I love... Uh, I love the, the man that I serve with, his wife, his kid, his son, and all that, all that the Lord's doing through his life. Yeah, I, I just amen and amen. And I, I think to be able as a pastor to not even be thinking about the musical side of stuff, even though I really love music and I appreciate music and, and, I, and I love to talk about music with our worship leader, um, and with the people on the worship team. And during the course of our service, I'm actually, I'm, I'm on the side of the platform and just there for those moments where it's like, I'm gonna walk up and, and the guy who leads worship for us, John Luke, like there's a, there's a female vocalist next to him and then he's there and I'll just, he just knows that if I go up to, to Taylor and touch her on the shoulder like that, she just reaches over and touches him on the shoulder to let him know so that I'm not like crashing in over him and, and he just understands that that's just, just, there's going to be a moment. And one of the things that, um, that I don't want to do, though, is just be consumed with what's the song list going to be. Or I need you to give me these songs for this thing. Like before John Luke was there, Danny Donnelly was with us for about 10 years. And um, I never once discussed content with him, ever. He would just through the week be praying, putting together a list. And you'd come out and in, I'd be on the side of the platform and he's singing song after song after song that just drop into the content of the message. And that's the kind of relationship you want to have with somebody who you know, they have a real living, vibrant relationship with the Lord. They don't see their, their 30 minutes se section of the service as, as this closed entity, but it is a part of a whole and they want to be in the, in the heart of God for that moment. So I think to have that kind of a trust relationship is just, just key. Well, I mean, that's it, right? You just, you want to be on the same page. 
I mean, that's what I want. We're all going for the same thing. So we, you really have to strive and work at throughout the week, being on the same page. Because as pastors, we're, we're the worship leaders as well. We're, our, our whole goal is to bring the word of God, but the, the, the musician, you know, whoever's singing is also singing the word of God and being on the same page. Where are we leading our people? You know, what's God doing in our congregation? And, and yeah, and just, you know, you're, you're co-laboring together for the people. It's not, here's your slot. Like someone said, you're the warm up for this slot in the service. I just don't think of it like that. I, I just want it all integrated and, and put together that, that the, the same thing that the Holy Spirit is speaking through the Bible study, speaking through the worship leader. So to get there takes a lot of extra work. And I would just really encourage you, um, if you're a pastor here, to do the work with the, the, music, the worship community in your church. And if you're a worship leader, to, to really try and uh, cultivate that with the pastoral team of everyone being on the same page together, week in and week out in the vision of the church and what, what's God saying and stuff. Yeah, you know, not much to add to everything that's been said is fantastic and pretty much the way I see it and experience it as well. Um, Scott and I have been working together um, in, in, you know, connection with worship for, um, you know, for like 18 years this time. And then we had a little break. But even prior to that, we, he was part of our worship team when I was pastoring in Vista. And so we have, a, you know, this long history, and it's almost like it's like he knows what I'm thinking. I know what he's thinking kind of a thing. And that, that's the beauty of kind of this long-term, you know, friendship. And, uh, and, you know, occasionally he'll text me, hey, you know, he, he pretty much knows the text where we're going. But he's like, what, you know, what's your emphasis or what's the Lord putting on your heart? And I might just send him a sentence back, you know, like maybe even the title of the message, you know. And then he just, from that, will kind of know where to go. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a sweet thing. And it's, uh, it's a, a partnership, really. In, it's a ministry partnership. And I think it's, that's awesome. You know, it's not just people that show up and like, I mean, you know, the, People, everybody does it differently. Different churches do it differently. I know some churches, they actually just hire a band and they come in and they do the songs and then the preacher preaches. And I, I guess it works for them. But, you know, I'm, I'm thankful for the relational side of it. I think that's a super important thing. Maybe a, uh, a follow-up to this question because you, you all talked about um, that, that relationship being important, a partnership, love and trust. And cultivating that and so maybe sort of a two-sided approach to talking a little bit about how do you how do you guys approach cultivating that as pastors from your side and then what are some encouragements maybe to share with a room full of worship leaders how could they approach cultivating that with their pastors right so I think on one hand, you'd say, hey, any kind of relationship that you're trying to be tight with, you're trying to have a lot of trust in, uh, you, it takes time. And it could be time you know, throughout the week that you're able to spend e with each other, but it could also just be the time of years of doing ministry together. And when that develops, uh, basically that trust is what leads to creativity. You know, I know for me, one of the things I appreciate is you know, as I'm studying and thinking, I'm thinking about issues that people in our fellowship are dealing with, uh, issues that our culture is dealing with, and thinking about how the scripture is going to apply to that. But it's so refreshing for me to hear from uh, our worship leader, hey, I've been thinking about how we receive our Sunday morning uh, offering. And it's a little weird, I thought, and maybe we could make this change or this tweak. And if, there's, if that trust isn't there, if we haven't spent that time together, then I don't even know that he would say that to me. And I'm definitely not thinking about those things on the front line, you know, but those are important things as somebody's worship experience as they come, you know, to be with the Lord. So I think it just takes time. You do have to understand, though, that, you know, your senior pastor, your lead pastor, 
Uh, he might not have, you know, uh, you guys might not wear matching sweatshirts and be best friends, you know, kind of thing. That might not be the reality. You might not be able to spend four hours every week, you know, together in prayer and just kind of hanging out together. But there could be times where maybe like a retreat, you're able to get away together and just kind of connect in that kind of way, a pastor's conference, something like that. Anything that you can do to expedite the comfort level with your senior leader. And it might just mean that you have 15 minutes each week that, hey, could we just sit down and I can, you know, hear from you. Is there anything you'd like to have different, you know, and just kind of touch base or a text message, you know, things like that. But you kind of, you can't force the relationship on your senior leader. It's kind of going to be whatever he is willing to uh, allow or embrace. But I know for me, I love that time. I love being able to talk about, uh, you know, what's happening on Sundays, but for, for us in our context, the biggest way that that accelerates is through a uh, weekly prayer meeting together. And we just keep that on the calendar every week. All our pastors get together. We're just crying out to God for our church and that helps them hear my heart. I get to hear their heart and we're united together by the spirit as we pray together. And I think that just speeds things up. Yeah. You know, for me, it's everything's relational. So um, one of the things that, that, we, that I want to make sure that I do as a pastor is respect the role that God has put that man in uh, and what God's called him to do. And that mutual respect, uh, what, what I've been called. I'm, I'm the most, uh, so, so I would be sitting here probably the most uncreative person on the stage. Uh, I'm, I'm very simple in my approach. I study the Bible, I teach it, and I love people. And then God surrounds me with all these creative people, people that, and I respect that, and I value that. And so I want to keep the lines of communication open. I want him to come, hey, Ed, have you thought about this? And what do you, and, and almost always, I'm going to go, that's a great idea. Let's try it. Uh, that sounds wonderful. Or, or just learning to say yes and learning to say, uh, let's test that because um, I'm surrounded not only by creative people, but people that love the Lord, love our church, and, and I need to give them. So once the respect is built in our relationship, then the very next thing that comes is freedom. And enjoy the freedom. Do what you believe God has called you to do. Um, lead us where I'm, I'm a part of the congregation, so I'm ready to follow Ian or Jason or anyone. I'm ready to follow them uh, because I want to worship and, and freedom. And, that, and then that means... Uh, with any relationship, it only grows uh, with two ingredients, any relationship, time and testing and how you respond to the test. So we, they, they have been very gracious. You know, I, I think of Ian in particular, who spent a lot of time with me. He's been very gracious with me for the mistakes that I've made with him, uh, mistakes that I've made as a pastor. And I hope that I respond with that, with being gracious with any mistakes that he makes. And when you get through a few of those, Man, the Lord begins to gel you together in such a way where it's seamless. And like Richard, you don't even think about it anymore. The, I, I know it, the dynamic of this changes with, with the size of the church, the size of the leadership. Like I was trying to think of, of how we do this. I've been thinking about like in Brian's world. Like, I mean, you guys have to have several different levels of staff meetings and stuff in your church by just the virtue of the size of your staff. Um, but... If, if your church permits it, if, you, if the size of the way your leadership team works, um, to spend time together is crucial. So we spend Wednesdays together, and we start at 9 o'clock in the morning. We just go to Pete's, and we just start having coffee, and we'll just talk about stuff, anything, like what's on the news, what's this, or, you know, we'll be sitting there, and some song will play on, you know, like some Bob Dylan tune will come on and go, that's such a great song, you know, and we start talking about music, and all these things, and we just kind of get worship. to know who, yes, exactly that. <laughs> and, um, and we, but we get to know how we think and how we process reality together. And we, those moments grow into the, the times where we can actually speak honestly to one another about things that we like or don't like, and, or the thing about how the offering felt, you know, uncomfortable. Those are, that's where we work through those things. We just talk about, well, what do you think about this? And, and suddenly you get to the point where it's like as different as we all are, there's a, there's a single mind. There's a single-mindedness. And so then it's within everybody's personality and giftings that they get to do what they do. And, um, you know, when, when Pastor Chuck asked me to come on as the high school pastor at Costa Mesa a long time ago, 
He just says, I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You just do what the Holy Spirit's telling you to do to the best of your ability. And there, that was so liberating. It was so liberating. And you can do that with, with your staff and with your team. And, and then the, as a pastor, I ask the question, how can I help you do that? That's what I want to know. It's like, how can I help you be the best at what you're doing? And, and, I, and I hope that that can be, if you're pastors, that that can be happening between you and your worship team. Or if you're, if you're a worship team member, that that can be happening between you and your pastor. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's really good because you just, you want to speak the same thing. But how many, how many of our worship leaders? I'm just curious. Okay. How many of our pastors? In the, okay, so we have two pastors and a bunch of worship leaders. Okay. And you're probably listening to us going, okay, we're getting your perspective. And you're going, man, Rich, can I be your worship leader? You sound awesome. You know, I want to work for you. And so I think what you're asking is, you know, how can we cultivate, what steps we can take? Well, first of all, just be awesome. Okay. If you're awesome, that's the first good thing that you can do. But the second thing is don't preach a mini sermon before the sermon. That's really good right there. Uh, a, thir a third thing I think that's really good is, is ask a lot of questions about what's working, what, song, what songs are working for you. Because, you know, you guys are going on YouTube and you're, you're seeing some amazing production on YouTube and the glory of the Shekinah glory is in your room. And you're going, I'm doing that song on Sunday, but you got some out-of-tune saxophone player that Sunday morning. <laughs> It's not going to happen. It's not going to work out. It's not going to sound like, and then you're just trying to cram it down the congregation's throat, and it's not working. After the third time, if no one's singing, get rid of the song. But anyway, I digress. But my point is, is that you, you want to find out, you want to speak the same thing. And so find out, you know, initiate those conversations of what's working, what's not working, what songs are, do you feel like ministering to the body? I remember when we planted the church in Boulder, and every time we did a hymn, the, the volume of the people just doubled in size, in, 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 in volume. And so we just started, it was just where they were at. I don't know, it was just, it was a thing. And so we just, let, let's do that. Let's do where people are connecting. Isn't that the goal? We want the people to sing and connect. We don't want to invite them into our YouTube glory experience you know we want to we want to connect them with what God's doing uniquely in that congregation because all of your congregations are unique different sizes your, your pastors are unique and so you have to forge that figure out a way take the initiative to to forge how are we going to best minister to the people and, and get them what they're meant to be doing and that is you know worship God yeah I just want you guys to know that I'm looking at a screen right here and I'm watching Pete talk. I don't want you to think that I'm just staring at the ground while my friend talks. Because <laughs> I saw myself and I'm like, well, I look like I'm going to fall I'll asleep say. here, but I'm not, I'm not. I'm looking at you. You're like Pastor Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> now, Pete, I don't know that I agree with that. Okay, I got a question. Here, here's my question for you guys that raised your hand as worship leaders. How many of you uh, are full-time on your church staff as a worship leader? Okay. So how many of you work a job and you're, you're there as basically kind of a volunteer worship leader? How many of you? Okay. That's a whole different ballgame right there, isn't it? Because we're all up here with, you know, established churches and long-term relationships and we can go to Pete's and hang out and you guys are at work <laughs> going, man, I wish I could do that. Um, so, so since that's the case, uh, you obviously don't have the, you know, the, these kind of advantages in one sense. So you just have to do your best to, to work with your pastor and hopefully your pastor will have that same kind of sensitivity you know, to connect at some point where you guys can, you know, build the relationship that leads to all the, the different things that we're talking about. But, um, um, but you know, God bless you guys. I mean, that, it's such a gift and a blessing to, 
I, I think of over the many, many years, the, the people that have just come and served, you know, on the worship team, worked, you know, 40 hours a week in another job or whatever, but they're faithfully giving their time. And, and that is something that is really uh, appreciated. So God bless you as you do that. And, and just, you know, just work with what you've got and just see what the Lord will do to, to help you guys make that connection, you know. So I, I think, and I'm hoping you guys are hearing this, a, a real theme that I'm hearing from you guys and I want to highlight is um, the kind of relationship that would invite and be able to receive feedback. And I think um, speaking from the musician side, that's a sensitive subject when you're talking about creativity, when you're talking about, um, you know, sort of putting yourself out there. And um, I think... Feedback is sometimes challenging to receive uh, from the musical standpoint because it hits real close to home. Probably something similar to feedback about our sermons, you know. It's like sometimes just I don't want to hear about it, you know. Um, so having said that, um, I guess what I would love to ask you guys is in the spirit of that, what are some things that you wish worship leaders knew? Um, I don't know if you know this, but I think sometimes worship leaders get together and they have conversations like, I wish pastors could just figure out that, you know, fill in the blank. What are the things that pastors, maybe not with that spirit, but get together and, and say, I wish, I wish worship like leaders knew. thing? Or you could go on a list. I mean, you mentioned one already, no many sermons before the sermon. Those well, kinds let, of things. Let me, let me just say one thing really quick. I, I wish worship leaders knew that it's okay to let the people sit down if they would like to. <laughs> because, it's very practical. you know, like a worship leader will just get up and like, let's everybody stand. And everybody stands. And then for 30 minutes, everybody's standing. And people are like, man, I'm kind of tired. I wish I could sit down. But, you know, they don't know that they have permission to sit down. So just tell them, hey, if you want to sit down, tell them about that after the first song, after the first song. Tell them it's okay to sit down if you would like. That, that, that would bless me if worship <laughs> leaders did that. And I'd love worship leaders. You know, God has given us this beautiful, wonderful thing called a tuner. <laughs> and they're meant to be stepped on and used at a, on a regular basis. Hallelujah. Can we hear an amen? All right. Don't repeat a chorus 30 times. <laughs> Unless you're Matt Redman. <laughs> he can do it. He, he's the only one that can do it, but he can do it. On a little more serious note. Yeah. Well, I was serious. <laughs> <laughs> I say you could repeat a chorus 28 times. That'd be fine, but not 30, no. Uh, you know, to me, what I want worship leaders to know is that you are just as important as any other servant in the church. And what I mean by that is that you're not just there because you're talented with a guitar or you can sing or the anointing of God is upon you to lead us in worship. Uh, you, you are one of the chief servants of the church. And you're there for the people to bring glory to God. And I have had the privilege of visiting uh, many churches and teaching at many churches. And what I've seen with worship leaders is those, almost as if they're just there for their stage time. And then they hide back in the green room somewhere or they disappear from the life of the church. And then uh, in one occasion, they, we couldn't even find them to come back to do the last song. And, and you, you, if that's you, you've forgotten the calling of God upon your life. You should be there early and ministering to the flock. You should be ministering to the flock while you're on the stage. You should find a place to minister to the flock while the Bible study is going on. I mean, for, for us, you should sit through the Bible study of your pastor and your church as an example to the flock. Uh, you shouldn't go off and get donuts and breakfast and try to come back before this. I've, I've seen a lot, and it's discouraging to me because you're the chief, you have just as much face time with the congregation as your pastor does. But I've watched that some pastors or some worship leaders not take that serious and not remember that 
you probably have more of an opportunity to minister to people because the music caught the emotion of someone. And so they come to you and they, they're coming to you. They look at you as a leader. They look at you as a pastor, uh, as, uh, if, as a person that's, that's representing Jesus. And, and I, would just, I would just want you to remember the calling of God upon your life, that that's your church family. If, and if you come as a guest, you know, perhaps you're coming in as, uh, to our fellowship as a guest or some. You, I, I would want you to serve the flock. I would want you to get to know them. I'd want you to see if uh, minister the ones that are crying. Or I would want you to serve the body. Uh, that you're not just important because you can play an instrument or because you can sing and you're very gifted and talented, but you're a servant and you're the chief servant, just like I'm the chief servant. If we both have that mentality, then we'll be able to minister to a lot of people and serve a lot of people instead of just perform. And, and, and whether you know it or not, it is, it's not super easy, but eventually performers are found out and exposed. And God doesn't want us to perform. He wants us to serve. And I challenge you anywhere in the Bible to say, well, Ed, there I hear this verse says to perform. Uh, We're not to perform. I'm not to perform in teaching a Bible study. I'm to be sensitive to the spirit, give a rhema word for the congregation or the church that I'm visiting, minister to them, serve them, connect with them, point them to the Lord. And and, and if, if you would just put that in your mind, I think we would make much more progress. You're not there to serve the senior pastor. You're there to serve the Lord. And when your heart's in tune with the Lord and my heart's in tune with the Lord, those, are, those aren't even going to be issues. We're just going to be serving the Lord together, serving one another, tripping over each other to serve one another. And that's where real joy is. I think maybe a thing that I would want to say is that as much as you probably really would love for your pastor to enjoy what you do and enjoy your ministry and really relate well to your worship leading, uh, he probably really wants you to enjoy his teaching. And, you know, it means so much to me when the worship leaders in our fellowship are there and I can see that they're actively engaged with the word of God as it's going out. You know, they're taking notes, talking with me afterwards about it, you know, not in a weird kind of you know, kissing up kind of way, you know, that was the greatest sermon ever, you know, or whatever, but that you know that you are a voice in their life is really, it's really important. It means a lot to you in, in leading a ministry to know that you're able to actually pastor the people that you're, you know, called to pastor, including the people that are on the platform with you, serving you in that, with you in that capacity. And then also, I think, uh, as a pastor, I would want worship leaders to know that Uh, it's hard being a pastor. Uh, There are certain things that are great about it and fun about it and really enjoyable about it, but as a leader, there is a pressure, and it it isn't always just as easy as having the right thing happen on the platform. There's just so many moving parts to a local church. And, you know, we wish that we could, you know, fund, for instance, every ministry in the church twice or three times as much as they're able to be funded. But there's just so many things going on and so many things to think through and so many pressures pulling in in different directions. And as, as hard as it might be to be a worship leader, it's also just as hard to be a lead pastor and to just kind of connect with that, to, to realize like a, a leadership role is a tough role. And there are times where you just don't feel supported and backed up. And to just know that your senior pastor is probably also going through that also to some degree, I think maybe is is helpful. Yeah. Yeah, One other thing, because there's so many volunteers here, is uh, those that are serving and working full time. um, And and those of you that that contrast with those of the guys and gals that have the privilege of being on staff is, is those that are on staff, please don't become so lazy and insensitive and forget how God raised you up. Because you guys that are serving in 40, 50 hours a week and then you're putting extra time in the church, that, like you are, you, there's a, it's such a blessing. That's what gets, that's what, that's what makes you seen. That's how God raises a person up through their faithfulness. So that w- those of you that are faithful, stay faithful, be more faithful. And those of you right now that are listening to me that are kind of mad that I'm even mentioning this, that you want me to pass the microphone back over here, is 
Those of you that are unfaithful, repent. Because the Lord wants us to hold each other's arms up. He doesn't want us to hang on each other's arms and make it harder to serve. The world is just so desperate, desperately looking for authenticity and transparency. And they're looking to the church. And then when they come to the church, you know, you don't return your email. You don't return your phone calls. Uh, you skip out and you're, wh whatever it might be doing, just, man, be faithful. And when you get privileged to, to get paid for doing for that, then be more faithful, not less. And you use the word desperate, Ed, and, and I want to encourage you in this. Don't be so desperate to have the opportunity to play or sing that you'll, you'll actually um, keep go hanging on to a dysfunctional relationship in a church and with the church. Because if you look at the New Testament, there's, there's, nothing, that, there's nothing that talks about an organized worship thing, right? You just have the church. And the church is a thing that the Bible says the Holy Spirit places us in the body where it pleases him. And when you read the book of Ephesians and it's talking about like we are these living stones and we are being fitted like this, this, this incredible beyond just like, like ingredients on a countertop together, but fitted together to where it's like it, you've, been, you've been put together, put in the oven to come out and you can't see where the flour left off and the egg picks up. It's like that's the fittedness that we're supposed to have. And, and don't be so desperate to, to do your thing that you'll go to a church where you really don't like the pastor or you don't like his teaching, you're not getting fed. You, you find your place in the body and so that the body is really functional and healthy because that's the witness that, that trumps your performing, your, what you can do with your instrument. It's like, no, this is a church. They, they're acting like a church. They're, they're breathing like a church. Just want to, I've just seen too many musicians go, well, I'll take the gig, but because nobody else will let me do it right now. But, hey, I'll do this even though I'm not going to go listen to your Bible study or I don't like your Bible studies. It shouldn't be that at all. So, You know, um, this kind of along those same lines, and, you know, everything that's been said is just fantastic. Um, but, you know, here, here's something that happens. It happens to almost everybody in ministry at some point. So you have to just continue to guard your heart and check your heart. But there there comes a point where it just becomes like a routine, you know, and you, ju you just do it because you do it. And you're no longer engaged really, you know, in with, with your heart in it. And, you know, last night as I was sitting in here listening to Matt and I'm thinking about, you know, the 20 plus years that he's been doing what he's doing. And, and you know, he mentioned that obviously he has to check his own heart as well. But I thought, you know, here's a guy who's still, he's just absolutely in awe of the Lord. And for him, it's like, he's not, it, this is not about anything other than, I, I just want to sing to Jesus because he is Jesus. And, and, you know, whether it's a pastor like us guys up here as preachers or, you know, in whatever ministry capacity we're in, there's always those temptations to just sort of, you just drift into a routine. You're just doing this because this is what you do. And you lose the awe, you lose the wonder. And, of course, when that happens, then it, it it, ultimately, it just permeates the whole atmosphere that that is the case. So uh, we have to keep seeking the Lord. And whether I'm preaching or you're playing a guitar or drums or whatever, you know, we have to remember, first and foremost, we're doing this for Jesus, the lamb that was slain, that redeemed me to God out of my sin. And just let that be the motivation for everything we're doing. And then, like Ed said, we're going to do it excellently when, we, when, we're, when we're remembering who we're doing this for. Yeah. That just makes all the difference in the world. So, I'd love to shift gears a little bit. We've been talking a lot about the relationship. Um, but I would love, and I think it's a huge opportunity to have all pastors on this panel to have you guys address from your perspective as pastors what what your assessment of the current state of worship in the church is. Um, and I'd like to kind of come at this from two angles as well, but we'll start maybe on the on the, um, the positive side. As you look and evaluate the state of worship in the church, a lot of you guys travel a lot and um, you, you see a lot of things outside of your own fellowships as well, but 
what do you see things that you really feel like are, are exciting and that God really seems to be blessing in terms of the, the state of worship in the church right now? <laughs> Me first. Uh, I don't know. In the 15 seconds that I've thought about this <laughs> since you asked it, I think for me, Zach, like, I, I realize that there can be a tendency with some people to say, like, oh, you know, the current music, it's so this or it's so that. But for me, I am excited. I think that, at least for me, I, I feel like I'm coming across music and songs that are both theologically rich, but also the music, the way it's put together, the way the choruses are put together, it, rele it allows for space for passion and prayer and reaction to these great truths in, in, in a way that I think culturally we can connect with. So I love that. I love the like prayerfulness and uh, the space for just even emotion, you know, to be part of our, our worship time as it's connected to obviously, you know, the truths of, of God's word. So I, I, that's my first reaction is I'm, I'm encouraged by that. You know, I'm excited about that. I know that, I know that the, the normal way of things is that, you know, more intellectual, uh, you know, types of churches tend to create, you know, maybe like drier, wordier, you know, kind of songs. And then more maybe like emotional uh, kind of churches tend to create songs that aren't as deep but are very fun to sing and play and all of that. But I, I, it seems to me like over the last few years, we were seeing more of a blend of both of those things coming together. And if you're involved in that, you know, I know Scott has been working hard to really bring theologically rich yet enjoyable to sing kind of music to the church. Pray, I, we praise the Lord for you. You know, that's, that's incredible. So, I, you know, I love that. And I, I feel like that's what I'm seeing. You know, I'm really encouraged um, having, you know, really no background or talent in this area, but just as a worshiper myself, I'm, I'm really encouraged by the songs that are touching the heart and the intimacy of relationship with the Father and intimacy of emotion. I mean, we all, we, we, worship is very emotional. Uh, worshiping God is very emotional. We were created emotional beings. And, and so I'm not, I'm not interested in touching the emotion in a shallow way, uh, just for the sake of touching emotion. But we're emo one of the ways that we are an outlet for us in our lives is to come to a worship service, a gathering like we are now, and just let it all go. Uh, whether somebody, you know, jumping in the back over here or somebody was kneeling, kneeling or someone was laying face down, all the different places of it releasing. And, and so what I've, what I've noticed uh, is that the, the, the songs are really touching the heart of the matter, whether it's like there's a song right now that we're, we're really talking about in our church where um, I forget who sings it, but uh, it has that phrase, when it hurts like hell. Are you guys familiar with that song? And so that's yeah. really disturbed some people in our church, that phrase. And we're, we're actually praying and thinking about that song because it disturbs them because they interpreted that phrase within a modern cult, uh, context that, it's, they're, that they're, trying, they're being slang. It's a slang. But anybody whose heart is hurt like hell knows that that's not a slang statement, that that's the reality of a person that wrote a song in the midst of her, I think it was a gal, that in the midst of her crisis that draws out, how many of you can relate with that phrase? And so you see, you can see that that phrase is something that was used to, to, to glorify God. But, what, but, but I'm, I just appreciate it. I don't know what the solution is gonna be in ministering to our church over that phrase, uh, but we're gonna pray through it and we're gonna make that decision. But I, I appreciate that song. It hurts like heck. What's that? <laughs> so I, I, think, I think one of the options was hurt so bad. Uh, was and, and I'm, I, I I'm, think there's actually two versions of it. Is there? Is yeah. There? I mean, yeah, there's I'm, the, I'm okay. I'm there's okay. the real version and then the... <laughs> and it's kind of like the Crowder song, maybe. The yeah, sloppy the wet sloppy kiss. Sloppy wet kiss, that yes. Was, that was always yeah. like... And then the worship leader would never get it right and the, the screen would say one thing. And it's yes. and still to this day, 2017, it's never synced. Like they yeah. never go over it with the multimedia guy and it's like sloppy wrong wet one, kiss. Wrong or one. Like whatever kiss or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, hurts like heck. I, I just, I, 
I just, I, I think that uh, you guys that are writing, just write where you're at, write what's happening in your life, glorify God theologically. I mean, I think that's, that's just an assumption that you're going to be theologically accurate uh, in the scriptures. But, but to allow the, I, I appreciate all of you that express yourself through song, because then you're inviting me to express myself through song, and we both meet at the cross, and I really appreciate that. Uh, one of the one of the high spots for me is when you can see um, someone like Brooke Fraser who has a, a, a standalone career as a musician, you know, record contract tours, and then she writes a song like "What a Beautiful Name It Is." That tells me a whole lot about where she's processing her life, because the bridge of that song it wrecks me. It's, I'm almost like gonna cry thinking about the bridge right now. I, it just wrecks me every time. You have no rival. You have no equal. Like, I just want to fall on my face. I want to pick up my, the stool and throw it all at once. <laughs> it's so profound. And yet, here is a woman who is, who is could dedicated to being a, a musician and a songwriter, and she loves Jesus. That tells me, like, I, I want to, I want. I want to minister to people in my church so that they can live their lives like that. Like that's going to come out of their lives no matter what they're doing. So, so the question, what does worship need more of today? Because I think worship needs more cowbell, first of all. Um, that was not the question. Okay. No. I'm sorry. No. No. Okay. What do I like? Okay. That's a really hard question, seriously, because um, cause worship when we're talking about music, right? Because we worship God in a lot of different ways. We're talking about worship and music. is so subjective, okay? What's awesome to you is not so awesome to me, not so awesome to, like, music is so subjective, right? So that's a really hard one to nail in a church because stuff that you're really connecting with um, is not connecting with other people. and. And so what I think, not in general, what does worship need, you know, generally, but let, how about just for us, like, or in our churches, what is, you know, you know, we just really need God's wisdom on what's, we're here to serve the people, like, we're just, as worship leaders, we're, you're just a vehicle, you know, you're a vehicle to get people from point A to point B into the throne room, and so what's, how can we, in a servant-hearted way, tap into where everyone's at and um, sort of set aside our subjectivity and then help the other people, you know, to work, you know, to, to the music, to the style or just the songs or even the content of the songs and all those things. It's a hard, I don't have an answer really. I just, I, 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 uh, I just want to state. Thanks. I want to, but do you have the answer? No. <laughs> no, of course thanks. not. But that's but I, that's true, isn't it? And so to, true. And to recognize it, and, and to and to not, yeah, exactly. I think there's wisdom in that. <laughs> you know, on the on the subjective thing. I mean, that that's so true. Um, so Sunday morning, I had a man come up to me after service, and he's in his 80s, and I've known him for a long time, but I hadn't seen him for quite a few years actually. So I think he maybe was at another church for a while. But he's back, and Sunday morning he grabbed me and he said, please forgive me. Okay? Didn't really even know what he was talking about. He said, you know, I've been really critical of what's happened here. He, he, he's a guy that goes back to Pastor Chuck's earliest days. He said, I've been really critical of what's happened here, especially with the music. And he said, and you know, it's me. I'm the problem not the music, not you, not the band. And I just said, well, you know, I hugged him and said, God bless you. And, and, and you know, but like, like you're saying, you know, it, it is a subjective thing. But I think at the end of the day, when the Lord is really with the, you know, the, the, the people that are leading that, that if the if the heart is right of the worshiper, it's it's going to translate regardless of what it is. You know, I mean, it's just it, whether it's a hymn or whether it's, you know, a, a newer song or it, it's a heart issue. 
And so if our hearts are right and we're really seeking the Lord, then it's, it's going to be okay. Um, going back to kind of your question, Zach, I, I am really, kind of like Nate said, I'm, I'm really encouraged by what I see, you know, in the, in the current situation. And I think there's, uh, again, like you said, Nate, I mean, there, there's theological content that I think is, is rich and there's good melodies that are enjoyable to listen to and sing along with and good choruses. You know, sometimes I think uh, it's a, one of the things that I think is a little bit challenging is, you know, we used to sing songs that were more chorusy, so you could just get the words easily and then sing along. Now, a lot of the songs, you know, have so many words. And I, I'm listening to certain worship uh, music, and I'm thinking, this is a great song, but how could you sing this? I mean, there's like 5,000 words in it, you know? <laughs> and, and plus, the people can sing really good. Uh, so I think we have to be a little bit sensitive just in some of that stuff. You know, some stuff is not necessarily congregational. It's more just personally, I can listen to this and enjoy it and worship myself. But to get a congregation to sing it is a little more of a challenge, you know. Yeah, but, but I, you know, I, I don't really have myself much criticism toward what I see going on. You know, I mean, you could probably, obviously, we could pick anything apart if we wanted to. But I, generally, I just think, man, praise the Lord for so much good stuff, you know, out there right now. Just in that same kind of evaluative mode, um, are there any concerns that you get when as you assess the current state of worship as much as you're able to? Are, are there concerns that you have, uh, things that you see, trends that you see? This is not really a concern. Not really a concern, but it kind of goes with what Brian's saying. But it's, yeah, but sorry. it is, it can be, it is a concern to many. Okay. And that is, can we take songs from this group and that group? And, and there's sort of, you know, uh, who, uh, who's the, the, the Chicago businessman and then his, his daughters died in the, and he wrote, It Is Well With My Soul. Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford. So, Spaffer. 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 so if you, so if you, if, if you, if you, read about his life the guy was a real crook I mean he was like he was just a scoundrel he was not this godly guy and he wrote that hymn and we're singing it in churches and and so if you're gonna like banish one group because of some other song or whatever whatever church it's coming out of man it, it, it what, what you want to do this is what I think and it's just probably my opinion but it's it's just take a song for what it's worth and the theological content for what it's worth and allow that to inspire worship. To me, I think every work and every worship song can stand on its own. It's not tainted, it's not uh, jinxed, you know, by where, what church it's come out of, okay? And so that's just me sort of addressing what could be a concern. That's a concern that gets brought up every year at this yeah. conference. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, are there other concerns that you guys? So don't have? sing "It Is Well with My Soul" anymore <laughs> in your churches. That's the moral of that story. No, I'm just. That's not the point. It's the opposite of the point. What, what was there? Um, what, wasn't there? I'm, I'm trying to remember because, there, like, around six months ago, there was some something that happened with somebody, uh, and and this became a discussion on Twitter and everywhere. And actually, the Horatio Spafford song came up as an example of, well, this this is the reality with this guy. We still sing this song. So it was some current person who, I don't know, I can't remember if they did something or they, you know, came out as supporting of same-sex. I, I can't remember what it was. But it was some, and the, and the question was, can we still sing their songs? And, you know, the, the songs, as I, I remember, there were some good songs out there. So there was this conversation, and that's, some of the guys I read landed on that very thing. Like, okay, here's a guy who wrote an amazing song that we've all been blessed by, but if you look at his personal life, it was really a wreck, you know? So, um, but you know, here's one thing I, I would say is, is, is just a bit of a concern that I think we need to be careful about. Because of the emotional nature of music itself, I think sometimes, and especially with the big event type of things that we see a lot of going on today, I think there can be, um, a, a substitute, uh, a, an emotional experience is being substituted for a spiritual experience. And, 
and people are thinking that because they had an emotional experience, well, I, I had a spiritual experience and I'm, and I'm really close to God now, and yet it doesn't connect them with scripture, it doesn't connect them with obedience to God. And so I think there is a lot of that happening today, unfortunately, you know, where you have people that are having these, these really great, I, I was reading an article, or I was actually reading a blog by um, a, a well-known musician a while back, and he was, he was describing this unbelievable spiritual experience that he had in the context of a Catholic ceremony out in a field. And he was just talking about the presence of God and everything. And now I know this guy, he doesn't really believe the Bible is, is God's, you know, authoritative word. He's, um, you know, Jesus is a savior, but he's not, you know, necessarily the savior. So, you know, I know all of this is going on. So I think now here's a guy who is mistaking a, a very powerful emotional experience for a spiritual experience. He is actually saying God was here because of the bells, because of the incense, because of the atmosphere. So I think that that is a danger that we have to recognize and be, we need to be aware of it. So everything again needs to, we just need to stay connected to scripture. And, and you know too, Brian, the thing that, that I think is because there's, music in itself is so powerful. It is absurdly powerful. And um, I think when you start adding production to it, like where, where does that leave off and the Holy Spirit pick up? Where does the Holy Spirit begin and then that stuff takes over? I think that the challenge to any, any ministry team, and I'm going to say for the worship leaders, for the pastoral staff, as a collection of men and women, is like how, how do we best do what we do and, and not have attention and not have it be a horizontal event? Not, not where we are moved, we think that's great, and all the environment, the, the venue is awesome, the lighting's amazing, the sound's great, the musicians just kill it, and nothing could happen, or something could happen. I, I personally, I'm kind of the one like, um, uh, the, let's just be as invisible as we can be. Let's be as transparent as we can be. Let's keep, let's, less is more, so that whatever's going on, at the end of the day, we can walk away going, wow, we really met with God. And we're not sorting through, like, did we, what really got touched us, what really moved us. That's, that's a concern for me. I, I, there's a couple of things in my mind that, that I think of, and, and one is that entertainment aspect. You know, if we, if we just seek to entertain, uh, whether entertain through our delivery of a sermon or entertain through music, that that that's, that's going to distract from the reality of the presence of God. It's a poor substitution, quite frankly, for the out, outpouring of the Shekinah glory of God on, on a particular event. And sometimes it's easy for uh, a, a worship leader to take that stage and then begin to think about the spotlight being on them. And, and, and entertainment is, is just not going to get us where we want to go. Um, but at the same time, you know, every to put down all production um, is... It's not possible because we all produce. We have lights. We have at least white lights. We have microphones. And, and so finding the rare balance is often a challenge that, that we're only going to find out by making mistakes. So it's okay to make mistakes, to stretch a little bit in communication with your pastor. And, and, and if you make a mistake, at least we're making a mistake seeking the Lord, uh, not seeking ourselves. Um, but the, the thing that, that really... I, I'm, I don't. I can't speak to the broader culture of music or anything because I, I just really trust Ian and Jason and those guys to help me in that area. But I can tell you this: one thing that I'm really concerned about is hearing pastors, pa worship pastors, uh, complain about their church that they're not worshiping. Uh, they weren't with me. Uh, I have a, a dead church. That's your responsibility. It's not, it's not you, to talk down on the very people that Jesus died for is not for us. You know, if I taught a message, oh, you know, the people just really didn't receive the message. Those bad, like, <laughs> are you kidding me? That, that's like the, I, I need to beg God to pour out his spirit upon me to anoint his word to get to the people and then to turn around and get mad at the very people that God has given me to serve. And so I, I, I've heard that with worship leaders complaining and they're just being open and honest with their feelings, but stop complaining about your church and start serving and loving them and finding a way 
to invite them into the leading of your worship and your style. And maybe you need to adjust yourself because I'm thinking of where Pete's been. Pete's been in Colorado, so you got to get yourself some boots and a cowboy hat in Colorado uh, and a Broncos jersey because that's how you're going to lead them in worship. And then you've been in Australia, and I don't quite know licorice or what, what's in Australia. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, you know, and so, you know, the style, you know, you guys that leave California too, you know, you can't just take Southern California with you to every state in the country. You've, you've got to know your people. You got to sit like Ezekiel. You need to sit where they sat. You need to know them, love them, but please stop complaining about your church. You know why? Because you're the church. And so don't complain about the bride of Christ. Just start praying and serving them. And before you know it, they're going to, they're going to follow you when they trust you and they know you love them. Yeah, we, we try to talk about that in our, in our fellowship with the worship leaders and pastors, you know, that, you know, because sometimes even like different church services, you know, throughout the day, there's like a different spirit in each one, you know, like, oh, this is the early morning service, you know, they're just going to be. And what we try to say is, hey, don't put yourself in a position where you are responding to the congregation's joy or lack of joy but put yourself in the situation where you are trying to overflow with joy for the Lord that influences them. You know, so you're the one setting the temperature in the room less than responding to whatever's happening, you know, out there. Because whatever you're wanting to see out there and what you're praying for, you need to be living that out, you know, yourself. Uh, I think uh, for me, a uh, concern sometimes is... Um, that a lot of the music that is coming out, a lot of the worship music that is coming out, if you really think about it, so much of it that we love is darn near impossible to experience um, with just one person and a guitar leading it. Uh, it's so big, it's built up so beautifully, and there's a time and space for that that's just really wonderful and unique to a big gathering of God's people and a full band and everything, but I find myself, you know, privately and personally, when I'm just singing to God and worshiping the Lord, I think a lot of people are like this. You kind of go back to singing the songs that you first learned when you first started walking with the Lord. So for me, it was like the late 90s, early 2000s. And I'm, it's usually very simple songs that you could sing with a full band or you could sing just totally by yourself. So I guess maybe an exhortation would be to make sure that you're leading your congregation in at least some songs that they would be able to do that with throughout the week. You know, maybe they can't do the full band, you know, kind of thing, you know, with some like chorus that like you have to be a professional singer to be able to actually sing that chorus. Maybe it's not that, but maybe it's some other song that they're going to throughout the week be able to more intimately with the Lord be able to repeat to him. And I think maybe another thing that concerns me at times is, um, you know, historically, we've had to be careful as a church that when we are doing missions work, we're not exporting Americanism and Westernism along with the gospel. You know, you're trying to preach the gospel and not your own culture because the gospel can survive in any tribe and nation and tongue. And um, I think we have to really be careful with just um, one ethnicity. And I think a lot of times it's a, it's, white people kind of being the driving force behind, hey, this is how our worship music is going to stand and uh, uh, look and feel. And I've been really encouraged seeing more diversity in the body of Christ with the way that we're producing songs and writing songs and trying to bring in other cultures and other instruments and other sounds into, you know, our worship services to try to not just reach everybody, but to be a respecter of the fact that, you know, we're to be a you know, we're, we're the only organization that actually could, because of the blood of Jesus, be multicultural uh, successfully. So we want to live that out as much as we can. So just kind of working towards that, I think, is a goal, but uh, it's kind of a challenge, you know, because you do have to, you kind of feel like you have to pick a style, and uh, sometimes that might exclude other styles. So to try to include more of the other styles, I think, is, is important. Uh, we'll wrap it up with this question and um, get everyone to lunch, but um, maybe going back to the relationship and 
uh, thinking in terms of just in the trenches, week in and week out, so much of our communication can be sort of task oriented. You know, what song, how many songs, hey, did you know about this and are the announcements squared away? And I'd love for you guys to take an opportunity just to encourage a room full of worship leaders. We saw the vast majority of hands that went up, people that are working full time and volunteering and pouring into their churches. Um, just not so much on the task level, but and you've done a lot of this during this conversation, but let's just close on this note of how much you value um, what they're doing and what God's called them to do in your churches and just speak some words of encouragement and we'll, we'll wrap it up. Well, I've tried to do that at the beginning of my session, you know, of teaching, just thanking you for, for what you do, but you really do in so many ways set the tone in the body of Christ and your prayerfulness, your worship, the atmosphere that the Lord is using you to help create and foster, uh, it just means so much. And, you know, as the years go by and you think about your fellowship, you think about the way things should look and feel and, you know, just the experience that people are having, it's just so important. And, uh, you know, especially, uh, I mean, I wanted to say, especially those of you who are not working on a church staff, but I know that working on a church staff is difficult too and has its own challenges. So just thank you so much for being willing to put yourself out there. You know, my, my oldest daughter is a, is a musician, a budding musician, and um, I can see how the challenge, you know, when an opportunity comes for her to play or to perform or to sing, there's a challenge there. She feels insecure. She's not sure if she really wants to do it and really wants to go for it. And you are making a commitment to put yourself out there. And I just so appreciate that. And I'm so thankful for you taking that step. So thank you guys. I, I really appreciate uh, the gifting that God has given you and your obedience to do it. When we moved from you know Downey, California to Colorado, it was just me, my wife, and my three kids. and. And we were excited about planning a church, and I had no idea what we were going to do for worship and and how we were going to how we were going to do that. And and then there you are, you're praying and you're seeking the Lord, and God's put you to it. Someone like me that says, "Man, I think I want to serve here. I think I want to to give myself here. I want to use my gifts and talents." And God matches you up. And so thanks for the faithfulness. Thanks for your prayers, your prayer life, your commitment in your marriage. Those of you that are married, the a commitment to raise your kids in the ways of the Lord on top of all the sacrifice uh, that you that that you have given all the time that that you've invested and and you know you think of all the time you've invested and then someone comes up after a service and says you know I think you missed a key or you missed the you hit the drum wrong or whatever whatever they say you know just like just deflates you and discourages you and just like as pastors you know they say that it that, that a pastor quits the ministry over five people or five people and the five difficult people, you know, you can have a church of a hundred people and five people get under your skin. And so maybe there's five people or four people in your life that have been getting under your skin. They don't like your music. They don't like your style. They don't like whatever it might be. Please listen what the Bible says. It says, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season, we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let's do good to all especially to those who are the household of faith. And I, just as a fellow believer, so appreciate you leading me, uh, someone that's not very musically inclined and doesn't remember words to songs, and, and you just lead me. I can close my eyes and trust you to lead me to the throne room of grace where I can find help in time of need. And if you haven't heard that lately, thank you for leading me to the Lord. That's, that's awesome. I, I, I would say to you, you do something that, that it's, it's a realm where you're compared to everybody, right? Like from, from like what kind of guitar are you playing? Like what, what, what is the make of the guitar? What's the model of the guitar, the drums, the keyboards? How well you can play, how well you can sing. Um, all of those things are begging to to um, really mess with your identity. And I really want to just tell you, you are not what you do. That is not who you are. You belong to Jesus. Your identity is in him. 
So it doesn't matter whether or not you're learning to play D, C, and G, or whether or not you have mastered the scales in every key, in every type of scale there is, whether you're the, you have a great vocal range or a small vocal range, you are loved by Jesus. And never, ever lose that sense of who you are. It's not, you're not what you do. That's great. Um, yeah, so, you know, you are such an important part of the church. You know, you are so valued and you're so important about what we're all trying to do. We're trying to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and a lot of that happens. A big part of that is what we do at Sunday morning services. That's the culture we live in. And a lot of people get connected with the church, not necessarily through the, the pastor or the teacher, preacher, whatever, but through the music. And so you're, you're very, you're so important um, in that. And I just want to say also that, you know, being in ministry, whether you're a pastor or a worship leader, like with a, if you have a microphone, uh, it's one of the most, it's the most vulnerable place to be. It's the most vulnerable vocation to be in because you're laying it all out there on the line like you guys have stated and so keep your identity in Christ that's that's where we're valued that's where it really counts you know Jesus told his disciples when they came back to 70 your names are already written in the book like you don't have to they're already there so rejoice in that you know and uh, don't rejoice in oh that was awesome we vamped it out okay you know we, we're awesome you know no your names are already written and so and then lastly just a shout out to the sound guys out there the engineers and um, um, you're you're just as important as anybody else truly you're part of the whole thing I mean you could have the most awesome thing happening with with the mu the musicians and uh, singers but man it can all be a train wreck if it weren't for you guys out there and so you are so important guys who who faithfully get there some of you are getting there early to set up and all of those kinds of things I mean you are a huge uh, asset yeah you're heroes in, in, um, to, to me to us and to the body and and you're you're not really seen you're back there and you're only noticed when something goes wrong right <laughs> and but anyway I just appreciate you guys so much So I just want to encourage you guys, uh, you know, to think about this. Um, I, I think one, one thing that we, we could all sort of say and, and just kind of visualize of what, what, what's our objective? You know, when we come together, I, I think our objective is, you know, that, that people would experience God's presence. You know, to me, that's, that's a huge thing. And I pray you know, before every service, it's like, Lord, just show up. That, that's all that matters, you know. I, <laughs> that, that's what we need. We need you. We need your presence. And, and I, when I think of the worship team, when I think of the individual, you know, up there uh, leading us, I think, you know, um, facilitates maybe not the best word, but in a sense, you know, that, that person is facilitating the presence of God. You are, you are welcoming, in a sense, the presence of God in. And just, you know, keep that in mind that that's, and that's a, a huge thing. That's an amazing thing. And, and remember that this isn't happening anywhere else in the world. This happens just as God's people gather, you know. So as you, as you come, you know, keeping that in mind, like this is a really big thing that we're doing. And we're doing it by God's grace, not because we're the best or any of that. And then just, you know, to humbly just be saying, Lord, would you just show up? Would you just come and, do, and bless us with your presence? And, and, you know, if we just approach that with, with open and sincere hearts, I think we're going to accomplish what we want to do. And that's, uh, and, and, you know, like somebody said, how many times, I just heard this the other day, you know, somebody come to church for a while, and they're like, I, that preacher guy bugs me. I don't really like him. I, you know, that, 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 the music, I just love the music. You know, and eventually the preacher kind of gets, you know, <laughs> they kind of warm up to the preacher and then go, okay, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's a really, um, it's a wonderful opportunity. And um, just take it for that and uh, thank God for the opportunity and 
And thank you guys for the, you know, we're, we're doing it together. It's a partnership. So God bless you. Awesome. Yep. Uh, can we stand together? Stand and uh, we'll, we'll pray. And I just want to pray a, a special blessing over you, remembering that Jesus said, when you give, uh, it will be given back to you, pressed down, measured out, and overflowing. And we just want to pray that blessing over you guys today because we know how much you give. So, Father, would you, would you bless each person that's here today? Lord, you know each one of them. Uh, as was shared already, Lord, they're, they're your children, Lord, first and foremost. And so we do thank you for their gifting, but we're even more grateful, Lord, for the heart that they have to use that gifting in the church for your name and for your glory. And so, Lord, what they have given and all that they continue to give, we pray that your promise would be true in their lives, Lord, that that it would be measured out, pressed down, and that, Lord, you would give in return, just pour out a blessing, and that it would be overflowing in their lives. Lord, we pray that this coming season of ministry uh, would be fruitful and filled with joy and filled with the joy of your presence, like was just being said, Lord, what we want every week, what we pray for, what we cry out for, Lord, just may your presence be with us and among us. And so, Lord, that's the blessing that we pray over them, over ourselves too, Lord. We all need it, and so we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.